All right, everyone, welcome to the next half of the 4-1 lecture. I'm going to try this full screen format because I'm going to be drawing on the screen. I think it'll be easier for you to see. So in this portion, we're going to start naming all of the different gross structures that we can see on the outside of the brain. Again, uh, every so the, the development of the brain is tightly controlled, so all of these uh, sulci and gyri, these grooves and ridges that we see on the brain, are, um, are, are translatable to other brains. They're pretty uh, much universal. There are slight variations in their appearance, but in general, um, these things are, are going to remain the same across individuals. And for that reason, we can name them and assign functions to them based on uh, you know, experimental and historical evidence. So here we have a lateral view of the gross brain. We can actually see some pia mater and the vasculature still on the surface, but that's not going to deter us. So here, uh, first off, of course, we have the lateral sulcus that we've already identified, and that separates the uh, frontal cortex from the temporal cortex below it. Of course, we also see the uh, pons, medulla, and brainstem, and uh, spinal cord, so uh, portions of the brainstem, and the cerebellum below that. Now next, we're going to identify the uh, central sulcus. So the central sulcus separates the frontal cortex from the parietal cortex. Uh, so we can see uh, that we're starting to divide the brain up into different broadly functional regions, just anterior, just rostral to the central sulcus is a gyrus called the precentral gyrus. And just posterior to it is the postcentral gyrus. The precentral gyrus is the primary motor cortex. All of your upper motor neurons are located within the precentral gyrus. The postcentral gyrus contains all of your sensory neurons. So all that tactile feedback you get from your body sensation, that ultimately ends up in the postcentral gyrus. So if we have a uh, precentral gyrus, we also have a precentral sulcus anterior to that. We also have a postcentral sulcus. So now we can see outlined those different gyri there. Now let's move down into the uh, temporal cortex. We see the temporal cortex has two different uh, primary sulci within it a superior temporal sulcus and an inferior temporal sulcus. This divides up the temporal cortex into three different gyri. The uh, uppermost one is the superior temporal gyrus. The one below that in the middle is the middle temporal gyrus. And below that, oh my gosh, can you guess it? It's the inferior temporal gyrus. Now let's move to the frontal cortex where we again see two primary sulci uh, dividing up the frontal cortex. We have a superior frontal sulcus and an inferior frontal sulcus. So because we have two sulci, we have three gyri. Uh, <clears throat> and for that reason, we can name them the superior frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus, and oh my gosh, this is so hard, the inferior frontal gyrus. Now let's move back into the parietal cortex. We're going to mix things up a little bit. The parietal cortex only has one primary sulcus. So for this reason, the uh, intraparietal sulcus, as it's called, divides the parietal cortex up into a superior parietal lobule above it and an inferior parietal lobule below it. The inferior parietal lobule is uh, further subdivided into a supramarginal gyrus here and a, an angular gyrus approximately here. <clears throat> so uh, as we uh, continue, there's a few extra things we're going to see here. Let's take a look. We have the uh, preoccipital notch, which separates the temporal cortex or it's a landmark where we can see the separation between the temporal cortex and the occipital cortex. And we can see the parieto occipital sulcus uh, right here. So that is the visible portion of the parieto occipital sulcus from the lateral 
view. And so those boundaries, we can now see uh, where the occipital cortex is uh, there in the posterior of the brain. So I think that's it for this slide. Yeah, so moving on to the next slide, we can now see the mid-sagittal view of the brain. So right here, we've cut right down that longitudinal fissure, and we can see uh, the inside portion of the brain because of this. Now, the uh, first, of course, we always want to get our landmarks. So the first main thing we see is the corpus callosum. So I'm outlining the corpus callosum in white right now. So the corpus callosum is the white matter tracts that's, that connect the two hemispheres of the brain, the left and right hemispheres of the brain. So that is the corpus callosum. We can see the uh, brain stem, we can see the midbrain, we can see the pons, and we can see the medulla going down into the spinal cord there. We can see uh, the cerebellum as well, and the cerebellum is partly cut in half right there. Uh, and of course, we, we have our uh, cortices as well. So let's uh, take a look at some of these primary features from the mid-sagittal view. We have the pericolossal sulcus, the sulcus that is on top of or over the corpus callosum, pericolossal. Just above that is a, a, um, a special gyrus. Uh, some refer to it as a cortex. It's not part of the frontal cortex. It's not part of the parietal cortex. And this gyrus is called the cingulate gyrus. Uh, so I'm filling in the cingulate gyrus here in this yellow highlighter color uh, right now. So just above the cingulate gyrus, we will find the cingulate sulcus. So the cingulate sulcus here in red right now uh, separates the cingulate cortex from the frontal cortex. The cingulate sulcus extends superiorly to form the marginal sulcus there. Now, do not confuse the marginal sulcus from the, uh, cent from the, um, uh, the central sulcus. These are different. The central sulcus, in fact, does not extend deep into the mid-sagittal view. So we'll see that in a second. Uh, but at any rate, well, next we have, oh, there's the central sulcus. So it just appeared, that little notch right there. So you can see, the uh, parietal cortex is actually extending from here to here, and the frontal cortex is uh, anterior to that central sulcus. So the marginal sulcus is not dividing the frontal and the parietal cortices. So just be aware of that when you're looking at this view. Don't get that confused. It's common too. Here's the parietal occipital sulcus. So now we know where the occipital cortex is. And within the occipital cortex, we have a horizontal fissure called the calcarine fissure. The calcarine fissure divides the uh, cuneus and the lingua, which are the two halves of the occipital cortex. So the uh, cuneus above and the uh, lingua below. Uh, so there's one additional feature I'll mention here. And it's kind of a landmark and an easy way to identify the central sulcus is the paracentral lobule. The paracentral lobule is highlighted here in green. It forms a W shape. So this is very characteristic from the mid sagittal view. It's visible on MRIs and CT scans. And it helps you identify the location of the central sulcus, which is in the posterior uh, dip of the W. OK, so let's move on to the next slide. So here we have a basal view of the brain. We can see the frontal cortex. We can see the temporal cortex. We can see the cerebellum. And of course, we can see the brain stem, uh, the, the uh, spinal cord going up to the medulla and the uh, vertebral arteries, the basilar artery, et cetera, et cetera. So, the, uh, let's focus on the temporal cortex. There is a sulcus on this inferior view, the basal view, called the occipitotemporal sulcus because it extends through the occipital and temporal 
uh, uh, lobes. And so highlighted in red there, uh, the next sulcus uh, more medially is the collateral sulcus. Between those two sulci is an important gyrus named the fusiform gyrus highlighted in yellow in here. So that's critical for uh, uh, identifying uh, objects in our visual fields, basically like naming objects, understanding objects. Uh, next, we have the parahippocampal gyrus medial to the collateral sulcus. And the medialmost portion of the parahippocampal gyrus is the uncus. The uncus uh, contains part of the piriform cortex responsible for our sense of smell, our conscious sense of smell. Now let's move to the frontal cortex. We have an orbital gyrus in blue and a gyrus rectus or straight gyrus in green. Between those two, we can see the occipital, uh, I mean, not that, the um, olfactory bulb and tract. Uh, so I just circled it in yellow there on that one side. So an important uh, little uh, caveat to this lecture is this lecture is intended not for you to understand all of these brain regions. It's intended to give us a base level of knowledge so that later on when I talk about these structures, then you uh, will know what each other is talking about. So I'm going to give you lots of names of structures on all of these images, and you're not going to have a clue what they do, and that's okay because for the rest of this semester, we're going to start adding on to this knowledge. We're going to be able to say this region has this function, and we'll be able to talk about neural circuitry and how these different regions interact and connect and process information. And so you're getting a lot of names right now, and you don't know what any of them do, and that's the intent at this point. This is just an overview lecture. We will add on to this information uh, later, we'll, and you'll get this functional information then. Right now, we just need to name these landmarks so when we talk about them, we understand each other and we know where these things are. Okay, so in this basal view, I'll also highlight one more thing, and that is going to be the circle of Willis. What color? What color? Uh, I'll use a... Uh, I've used like every color already. So I'll use uh, red, I guess, because it's a uh, artery. So here we can see the two vertebral arteries coming together to form the basilar artery. Branching off of that in either direction are the PCAs, the posterior uh, cerebral arteries. Then you can see the, uh, so I'm just on the side of the posterior communicating arteries on either side. So those connect up with the middle uh, cere uh, cerebral arteries, and here we can see the internal carotid arteries on either side. So from here, uh, we're heading anteriorly behind the optic tract, and you cannot see it in this picture, but the anterior cerebral arteries, ACA, and the anterior communicating artery will be right about there. But on this view, we can see the optic tract and the optic chiasm the optic nerve right there. Uh, so all of the, the ACA is deep to that. You can't see it from this view. So now let's take this view and magnify it a little bit so we can see the brain stem. Now here it is, the basal view of the brain stem. So this is where all of the cranial nerves are branching. This is where they are coming out of the brain stem to head into whichever foramen or foramina uh, they travel through to go to the periphery. And in this view, we can see every single one of them, although some are a little bit more difficult than others. So at first, up top, cranial nerve one is the olfactory bulb. So here what we see is actually the uh, olfactory tract and stria uh, coming from the olfactory, the olfactory uh, cortex, the piriform cortex. So that's the roots of cranial nerve one here. Next, we see cranial nerve uh, two, the optic nerve. We can see that on the other side, and we can see how it's forming the optic chiasm with the optic tract behind it posteriorly. And we also see some interesting features here. We see this little uh, 
bump there, that is actually the infundibulum or the pituitary stalk. So just above deep two from this view, the optic chiasm is the hypothalamus. And that infundibulum connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. Just below that, we see two little bumps on the bottom of the brain. These are called the mammillary bodies. They are critical for uh, memory consolidation. They're connected to the hippocampus um, via a very uh, uh, high fidelity uh, 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 white matter tract called the fornix. And so the mammillary bodies here, and yes, that means the boobs of the brain. So we've got another fun little name. Uh, somebody named those things a long time ago. Next, we have the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve three. Right there, we can see that coming out. Uh, after cranial nerve three, we have the trochlear nerve. Remember, the trochlear nerve is an exception to all the other cranial nerves because it exits the brainstem from the posterior side and then wraps around laterally uh, to head through the superior orbital fissure. And so it's very difficult to see, but you can see it on both sides. So I'm gonna circle it. You can see just a little bit of the fiber of cranial nerve four, trochlear nerve, right there. Next, we have the root of, of uh, trigeminal nerve. So here is trigeminal nerve right there. And moving medially, we have the uh, abducens nerve, uh, cranial nerve six. So cranial nerve six, I'll label it right there. So now we can see uh, some uh, bundles of nerves coming out on the sides of the brain stem. So these are all closely packed. So next is seven or facial nerve. You can see seven branching out right there at the uh, pontomedullary juncture, and eight is just below that. Now, if you look closely, you can see a small uh, little fiber that's separate from seven and eight, right between the both of them. And that fiber is uh, called nervous intermedius, and that is actually corda tympani. Those are the SVA fibers of corda tympani. And so this is one of the things that anatomists uh, like to argue about. We go to conferences in Italy and sit around tables with tablecloths and we slosh wine in our wine glasses and we argue about what's a cranial nerve and what's not a cranial nerve. Is nervous intermedius its own cranial nerve? Is it 7.5? How many cranial nerves are there? And so that's how we have fun uh, and that's uh, a little insight. But uh, typically, canonically, all of our textbooks, we consider nervous intermedius to be part of cranial nerve seven. And then there's fewer numbers for you to remember. So that's another benefit. So next we move down, we have a bunch of bundle of fibers here. We have uh, cranial nerve nine, glossopharyngeal, and we have uh, vagus after that. Vagus has a number of components. So uh, oh, for some reason, I did an X there for cranial nerve 10. Uh, it's supposed to be Roman numerals, but it's hard to uh, work on this trackpad, so there you go, whatever. Uh, so now we have accessory, a spinal accessory nerve, cranial nerve 11, and we can actually see the full length of that cranial nerve 11 fiber traveling all the way down into the upper portions of the brainstem, and we see those individual roots coming off of uh, the anterior portion forming cranial nerve 11 there. <clears throat> now, where on earth is cranial nerve 12? Uh, well, let's see, cranial nerve 12 actually comes out between the pyramids and the olive, and you can see cranial nerve 12 right there. That is cranial nerve 12. So here we have the pyramids, and lateral to that is the olive. So the pyramids, as you remember from your spinal cord tracts lecture, the pyramids contain the descending upper motor neuron tract. So you can see the pyramids on either side. Uh, the olive is important for uh, balance and um, uh, uh, motor control from the cerebellum. So we'll talk about those later. But uh, also to give you some landmarks, the pawns uh, right there. You can see the pawns. 
medulla below that with the um, pyramids and olives. And the midbrain we cannot see, but one thing we can see part of the midbrain is the uh, cerebral peduncle, cerebral peduncle right here. And again, that is the connection uh, between the brain stem and the pond. So all of these descending and ascending fibers, the corticospinal tracts, the spinothalamic tracts, coming from the cortex, traveling through or coming from the spinal cord and going up to the cortex, uh, that is the cerebral peduncle we can see there. And of course, the cerebellum uh, on the side. So uh, I think uh, that is basically everything on this slide. So let's take a look at the next one. Okay, so on this slide, what we've done, we've taken the brainstem from the previous slide, we've turned it around 180 degrees, and we have removed the cerebellum. So now we can see the deep portion of the brainstem, of the posterior view of the brainstem. So here's the part of the cerebellum uh, that's remaining from when we re removed it. You can still see uh, cranial nerve 11 there, uh, the accessory oculomotor motor uh, heading down. So now let's take a look at some of these new features we're seeing. So we have also removed the, uh, the prosencephalon. So here we can see the uh, cerebral peduncle, uh, again, with all those fibers traveling up and down through it. Uh, so that is the cerebral peduncle. Between those cerebral peduncles, we see the epithalamus with the pituitary gland, uh, part of the epithalamus there. That squishy part is the pituitary gland. We also see some bumps below the pituitary gland. These bumps are the tectum. And if you'll recall, I said the tectum is composed of the superior and inferior colliculi. The superior colliculus is important for uh, uh, visual uh, functions and the inferior is important for auditory functions. So we can actually make out the, um, the LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus and the medial geniculate nucleus on either side of uh, the structure and medial geniculate nucleus. Okay, I don't have room to draw that in. So one interesting thing we see below the inferior colliculus is one of the cranial nerves, the trochlear nerve as it branches posteriorly and travels laterally around the midbrain. And so we can see trochlear nerve right there as it leaves the brainstem in the posterior. So that is trochlear nerve. Now, we removed the cerebellum, if you recall, and the cerebellum, just like the cerebrum has a peduncle, the cerebellum has peduncles as well. In fact, the cerebellum has uh, three pairs of peduncles. It has a superior peduncle, it has a middle uh, cerebellar peduncle, and it has an inferior cerebellar peduncle, which I've outlined here. Uh, so these all, when we get to the cerebellar lecture, uh, have different fibers that go through them, different functions. We'll learn about those at that time. Now, uh, we have to talk about the fourth ventricle because we know the fourth ventricle is deep to the cerebellum and we can see the fourth ventricle in this slide. So the fourth ventricle is roughly diamond shaped. So this region here is where the fourth ventricle is located. And the anterior wall of that fourth ventricle is called the rhomboid fossa. The rhomboid fossa has uh, several important features that we need to talk about. So we've talked about all these nuclei for the cranial nerves. Uh, well, in this posterior view of the pons, we can see some of the bumps where these nuclei are located. And these bumps are called tubercles or trigones or colliculi, things like that. So the largest uh, bump uh, that we see is the uh, facial colliculus from cranial nerve seven, facial nerve. So that contains the uh, facial motor nucleus uh, deep within it. So from this view, we call the bump a colliculus, but if we section through, we would call the nucleus inside of it the uh, facial nucleus. Uh, 
Um, okay, so now let's continue inferiorly. We can see now uh, this little area here is called the vagal trigone. Uh, vagal trigone, and below that is the hypoglossal trigone from cranial nerve 12. That's where those nuclei are located. Uh, let's see what else we have. So outside, so that's the uh, that is the rhomboid fossa. The rhomboid fossa has an apex at the top and an obex at the bottom, and so that. Um, the fourth ventricle, you can see where the obex is, where I just circled it, is continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. So that continues down that opening. So just outside of, inferior to, we have a couple extra tubercles. We have the gracile tubercle here, and we have the cuneate, uh, cuneatus tubercle here. Uh, now recall from the ascending tracts, we have the gracile fasciculus and the uh, cuneate fasciculus. And these are where the nuclei, the tubercles, are located for these ascending uh, somatomotor, somatosensory tracts. <clears throat> okay, what else? Uh, what else do we see here? Uh, I think that's going to be it for the moment. So um, now the next section is going to start looking at sections through the brain uh, at a varying different depths within the brain. Uh, so we'll do that in a separate lecture here in just a moment.